Now I'll read today's passage. Today's passage is Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. Once again, Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. And he said to them, Truly, I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them to a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. Please allow me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift your name on high. Thank you for allowing us to be able to gather here with our brothers and sisters in Christ today. We know that the World Cup for Soccer has taken place, and it's taking place amidst the war in the Ukraine going on, and there's been all kinds of different things that have happened in light of that. It's true, Lord, that we too are, are sometimes losing our focus of you as well and because of things that catch our eyes. However, even though we are walking in darkness to some extent, we know, Lord, that you are present everywhere. Today, Advent has started, and it is, hard, it is truly hope and light in the darkness. Lord, we ask that we'll be able to hear something from your message today that will enlighten our hearts. And we pray for the pastor speaking today as well. We pray in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Hello, everyone. The Advent season has begun. We're in the first week, and you can see how there's some Christmas decorations on the stage here as well. You know that there is a lot of darkness out in the world today, and that is the season that we're in as well. But amidst all of that, we do have the hope for Christmas and the hope in Jesus and the cross, and this is a good opportunity for us to remember that. Today, we're going to be going over a message from God from the passage that was just read a moment ago. I'd like to first tell you something that really impressed me recently. In Rotterdam, the Netherlands, there was a husband and wife who celebrated their 50th golden anniversary, and they had this party at their house in celebration. They invited uh, people there, of course, and they noticed there was this broken vase there that was on display, and they asked the wife, why is it that you have this broken vase there on display in your house? 
And the wife said the following. She said, well, this vase is what my husband gave me 51 years ago when he proposed to me. And I was so happy and so surprised that the vase that I held in my hands broke. It fell and broke. And that's what this vase is. So she kept it all these years to not forget the joy and the happiness she felt when she first heard the news. And I think that's the same thing about Jesus. Is that only myself that I'm thinking? <laughs> no. I, I'm really impressed with this. So, Anyway, anniversaries are opportunities for us to remember something that has happened in our past. For example, our birthdays or anniversaries, or for Christians, perhaps the day you confessed Christ or when you were baptized. So anniversaries are a time for us to reflect on the impression and the joy we experienced in the past. Today's passage is also kind of like an anniversary in a sense for the disciples in, in respect to what they experienced. In the past um, passage, we looked at Jesus' uh, interaction with the disciples and we remembered uh, what he said. Here, following in verse 1, it says, Truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. This kingdom of God coming with power here that's being mentioned is actually referring to the description here in verses 2 and thereafter. In today's um, passage focus, uh, focusing on the transfiguration on the mountain, we're going to focus mainly on three points. The first point is how the Old Testament is actually heading to the cross of Jesus Christ. At this time, Jesus went with Peter, James, and John, three of his disciples, to a very high mountain. And at that time, the Jesus and the disciples were, able, were thinking referring to this high mountain and it's likely it was Mount Hermon which has an altitude of about 2,814 meters so it's a little higher than Mount Nantai in Japan so these three disciples and Jesus went up there and why is it that they did so? well in a parallel passage it is said that they went up there to pray and while they were praying all of a sudden in front of the disciples Jesus transfigured and how is it that he changed? Well, in verse 3, it describes this by saying, his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. So you kind of wonder, what kind of white was this? There's a famous um, uh, former Paris model collection model by the name of Amika, and then she's an entertainer now, and she often, or she actually said in the past, there are 200 shades of white. <laughs> And this is actually something that is commonly said in the entertainment world, but it just it just expressing that actually the color white is something that is available in all kinds of shades. However, when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, it was likely a white that they couldn't even imagine. That's what it seems like anyway, based on today's passage. And it's likely once we get to heaven, we'll finally know. And this is expressing how Jesus was being uh, expressed through uh, God's glory. Jesus' whole figure changed, and that was why it is referred to this transfiguration on the mountain. And then something even more surprising happened as well, and that's that all of a sudden Elijah and Moses appeared as well. And Elijah and Moses are actually... Uh, very uh, prominent uh, representatives of the Old Testament. And they actually represent law and the prophets in the Old Testament. M Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. In other words, these two are the ones who are representing the Old Testament and are talking with Jesus here on the mountain. The three of them are talking about... Uh, a content that is not mentioned in Mark, actually, but it is mentioned in Luke 9.31. Mm -hmm. 
They spoke about his Jesus' departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. In other words, Jesus was already talking about what was going to happen on the cross a half year later, and he was speaking about that with them on the mountain. So, what was this actually expressing? Well, it's expressing how the laws and the prophets, in other words, all of the Old Testament, were actually pointing to what would be happening to, happening to Jesus on the cross and also prophesying that. The Old Testament as a whole shows us how Jesus is, was truly leading toward the cross. And we can see how that this also helps to show. Many people, how Jesus truly is the Messiah. For the Jewish people and the Jews, Jesus referred to uh, Je uh, those who believe in Jesus are referred to as Messianic Jews. And if you if you read the reports of Mish Mish Ishimoto who went to Israel or the Bridges for Peace (BFP) reports as well, you can realize the number of such people is increasing. In today's era as well, along with the Koran and other Muslim uh, believers, there are a number of people who are now actually coming to faith in Christ. In the present day, in Afghanistan and Iran as well, there are revivals going on of Christianity. And of those, the number of Muslims who have converted to Christianity, if, for example, from 680 to 1,400, actually is smaller in number than those who are coming to faith in Christ now, 2,000 years later. Almost. So how is it that this period of 1,400 years could be so much smaller in number of people converting than the past 50 years? Well, one of the reasons is this the, the development and expansion of the Internet around the world. Up until now, some people only knew about Jesus through the Koran and what was written in that. But all of a sudden, now, through the Internet, they're able to find out the true information through the Bible on the Internet. They're able to realize that the Old Testament prophesied Messiah is actually fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and that is how many people are coming to faith and converting to Christianity, especially for Muslims. They are actually coming to faith in Christianity through various dreams and visions given to them by God. And in these dreams and visions that have been evaluated by an, by Tom Doyle, it says he's found that actually the same man has come in these visions, and that's, that man is wearing white clothing. And expressing love for these people, and expressing how he has also given his life for them, and asking them to follow him. So, of course, this would refer to Jesus Christ. In Egypt, there are some people who who are actually seeing many of these dreams and visions, and actually coming to Christianity and mentioning that in the newspaper. They actually wrote that if anyone has seen such a vision with a white man and wearing clothes, then he is trying to tell you an important message. And if you want to know more information about this, please call the Christian Church. In the present day, there are many people, Muslim, who are converting to Christianity, and a third of them, it's said, are, have that uh, caused by dreams and visions. In today's passage, Jesus here is talking once again with Elijah and Moses and proclaiming how that is going to connect with him going to the cross, showing and proving how all the content of the Old Testament is actually leading to the truth of Jesus Christ. And in addition, the Old Testament shows not only how Jesus is going to the cross, but also it gives us uh, encouragement as well. As we, we read the Old Testament, it's important to reflect on Jesus Christ and the various incidences that happen and the festivals that are mentioned. And we can see how they are all directing our hearts toward what Jesus would be doing in the future in the New Testament. As we're focused on the cross, reading the Old Testament, it's 
much easier to gain a better understanding of what the content is. The second point today is that the Old Testament is heading, uh, uh, is also the presence of God. So Jesus here is talking with Elijah and Moses, and the three disciples, James, Peter, and John, were very impressed with this. And there was one disciple who wasn't able to keep his mouth closed. That was Peter. He actually said the following in verse 5. Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. In verse 6, it says, he did not, he, Peter, did not know what to say. They were so frightened. However, you can see how Peter's uh, true um, idea was, imp uh, intent was impressed, and that he really just wanted to be there with Jesus, and that's actually something that's quite impressive. Verse 7, in verse 7, all of a sudden, the disciples are surrounded by a cloud, and it says it covered them, and that is actually what is expressing uh, God's presence there. In the Old Testament, when they were leaving uh, in Egypt, you may remember God's presence expressed through a cloud then as well. And then they heard a voice from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. In Jesus' voice, uh, sorry, in Legion's lifetime, there was two times when they heard God's voice from above. One was when he was baptized, and one is here. And they hear the disciples once again were uh, experiencing being surrounded in a cloud by God's presence. In our lives, in our faith lives especially, we can experience God's presence and sometimes even hear God's voice. And in some ways, this can actually give us an encouragement that we are truly believing Him, not just in our heads, but in our hearts. And we can realize that God is truly present with us even in today's day. This experience of God's present is something that can give us great encouragement. I would like to share the testimony of a person by the name of Kazuko Ando, who has written the book, If You take off a Darwin's glasses. She's an author, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit about it. When she was small, she through books, she learned about science and became very interested in science. She wanted to really understand the essence of life. After graduating from high school, she went to uh, Osaka University and then went to a graduate school studying about biology. When she was a child, she just um, really didn't believe in a specific God or any God for that matter. And she just figured that anyone who believed in a religion was a weak person. And she studied uh, biology from the basis of an atheist, believing that uh, that was truly what the truth was. However, there was a time when all of a sudden a turning point occurred in her life. She all of a sudden looked back over her life and she kind of started to wonder why is it that she was even alive and if she died, where would she go? And she realized that atheism and evolution couldn't give her answers to those questions. It was the time when she I found an advertisement in her post box uh, for a, a church, and it was a tract. The tract title was something that actually gave her an answer, or seemed to give her an answer to what she was wondering about, so she was interested. She didn't understand, didn't like religions, but it wasn't like she didn't like Christianity. And one of the reasons why is she really respected Mother Teresa. So one day she decided to have courage and went to the church. So let me just say, uh, read you a little bit of what she had to say. First, I had difficulty going to the church services, but I really wanted to know if Christianity could answer my questions, so that's why I started to go to church. 
I would go to the service in the morning and go to a different uh, church in the afternoon and evenings and go also on Wednesdays too. I just really wanted to know what was written in the Bible and decided I would go to church services until I'd finished reading it. However, after about two months of going to churches, I wasn't able to find the answers I was looking for in Christianity. And that's what I decided. And I realized I was a scientist and that religion obviously had nothing to do with、uh, science. So I was about ready to give up on it. I was going, leaving my house to give up on going to church, go for the final time. But all of a sudden, I like, heard this voice I am God. Why is it that you don't know that? When I heard God, I thought, well, this is really strange, but like, I, I pretty, was pretty sure I'd heard, heard his voice. And so I said, yes. I, I, I responded in my head anyway. And just to my surprise, I just started to cry like a waterfall, water, water coming from a waterfall. And my entire body just felt like it was being encompassed in a, a peace. And I realized that I had been a really stubborn atheist, but in just an instant, all of a sudden, I was able to realize the true Creator God, the Creator of everything, and gave in faith. I became a Christian. Thereafter, as a Christian, she began to walk forward in her life, and all of the evolution and atheism that、uh, she had experienced so far really kind of held her up a bit. However, as she was studying the Bible, she came across one aspect of, of, of truth, and that it's, it's not the Bible, that the Bible is in contradiction with science, but rather it's actually supporting scientific discoveries. In this way, Kazako began to hold various seminaries of creation science. She has opportunity to speak to a lot of people, and she often gets a lot of questions, a lot of the same questions. For example, why is it that you can believe in God if you're a scientist? And she replies the same way every time she says, It's because I'm a scientist that I do believe in God. She's able to, she, because she was able to experience God's presence, that truly changed her life. As for ourselves, in our lives of faith, it's,、uh, it's possible that we too have experienced God's presence at times, or through healings, or perhaps when asking for the Holy Spirit, we have experienced His presence as well, or perhaps through prayer or sing songs of praise in、uh, services, we too can experience God's presence as well. And at those times, It gives us the opportunity to realize that God is speaking to us and that He is saying to us, I, I, You are my child and I love you. Let's look at the third and final point today. It's the place to return to during a trial. In verse 9 today, it says, As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone that they had seen until the Son of God had risen from the dead. And why is it that Jesus was not wanting them to tell them about this wonderful thing that had happened? It's likely that at, those, at that time, the disciples and the people around them were, had a different vision of, or understanding of who the Messiah was. Until Jesus was able to actually fulfill his uh, uh, position on the cross, then they wouldn't truly understand. The Israel people actually thought that instead the Messiah would just be this political leader or、uh, someone who would liberate them from the Roman Empire. And so it would be really difficult if the disciples all of a sudden were proclaiming about the Messiah on. On the mountain, because that would lead them to believe that a political unrest or a military act was about to take place. And verse 10 says, They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. In other words, they were not sure exactly what Jesus was talking about, about the cross and death and resurrection. For the people at that time, they couldn't believe that a Messiah would die. 
and when they were uh, that in light of this, uh, it says they asked him, "Why did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And that's because in the Old Testament in Malachi, it explains how until the Messiah comes, there's going to be a person by the name of Elijah that comes to the stage. And, and they have this image of Elijah as being this true victor in a sense. And so that's why the disciples were asking of Jesus about this person of Elijah. Who is this victor, Elijah, who is supposed to come? Because if he comes, why would the Messiah need to die? However, Jesus replies to them in verse 12 by saying, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected? So he's saying to them, Well, I know you don't know who the Messiah is, but you also know that in the Old Testament, there's many passages that explain that the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected. So how do you understand that? So he's once he's referring to actually what is mentioned in his Isaiah. Jesus also says in verse 13, But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wish, just as it is written about him. In other words, Jesus said that John the Baptist actually was this Elijah that was spoken of. And what is it that happened to him? Well, uh, he, uh, King Herod uh, had his head cut off. And in this way, Jesus was telling the, prof the disciples that Elijah is not this like uh, abundant victor, victorious man, but rather uh, someone who is actually persecuted and killed. So, in other words, what happened to the forerunner happened to the Messiah, and what had happened to the Messiah would be happening to those who believe in him. And in today's passage, Jesus is giving um, an even further message. As I just said, whatever happened to the Messiah would be happening to those who believe in him. In other words, what happens to Jesus would be happening to the disciples as they would be believing in him. As Jesus went, died and was resurrected, it was true that the disciples had to go through a harsh persecution. So, how is it that he could have been okay? Well, if you look at today's ma passage, you could see how they were probably very confused about Jesus and the cross and all of that. And they, but you also realize that when they were in persecution, they didn't just easily give up on their faith. And actually, surprisingly enough, they all carried on their faith until they died. This, these three disciples in particular uh, died in the following ways. James was uh, killed by Herod Agrippa, and Peter was killed by Emperor Nero, and John was not killed, but actually he was sent to Patmos Island for uh, isolation. And in this way, all of them kept their faith even till the end. And it's not true of just these three disciples, but e except for Jud Judas who uh, betrayed him, all of them kept their faith until the end. How is it that all of them who were so weak could so strongly keep their faith until the end, even through harsh persecution? Well, it's, it's something would have had to have changed in them. And one of the main changes you can imagine was that they experience God's presence. They, the greatest experience of the presence was that of meeting the resurrected Christ. However, we know that these three disciples mentioned here also would have been greatly impressed and encouraged by this experience on the mountain. Peter thereafter would actually reflect back on this um, experience in Second Peter verse 1, 16 through 18, saying, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were here with him on the sacred mountain. And in this way, Peter was able to reflect back on this experience of God. And you can see how that truly did greatly impact his life and his faith, giving him encouragement to be able to withstand such harsh per persecution as he and others faced. As for you, how is it that you actually became Christian? What is it that gave you the opportunity or the led you to Christ. Of course, if everyone has a different story. Some people were invited to church or other people perhaps <laughs> wanted to get to know a Christian who, woman who was Christian and in that way that led to the opportunity to come to church. There's one young person who watched a TV program that had to do with the gospel and in watching that, <laughs> they figured they would be able to beat beautiful people if they went to a church, and so that's uh, how they came to know Christ. And he actually is uh, doing great in his faith walk. So there is a lot of reasons and opportunities that lead people to Christ. Some people have Christian parents, for example, and they just start going to church at an early age and come to faith in Christ along the way. However, as they're walking, forward and there is a time likely when they will be able to experience God's presence individually and at those times it truly does give you the conviction and the encouragement that God truly is there and when you experience God's presence it really does provide encouragement when we are we are feeling down in our faith and it gives an op opportunity for us to like turn back or return to this place of this experience we had with God so there in, in 1549 there's a person by the name of Francisco Xavier who came to uh, Japan to spread Christianity and at that time, it said that 300,000 to 400,000 people became Christian. Some people say, well, it was probably just haphazard faith or not the real thing. Because at that time, people just wanted guns. And they wanted to do anything to get a gun, so they would say anything or do anything to do so. And at that time, the feudal lords um, actually said that they automatic or actually became automatically Christian just so they could get a hold of military um, guns. However, I don't think that is all truly the case in all uh, cases because when there was a severe persecution against Christians, there are, were uh, several hundreds of people and Japanese people who actually were singing songs of praise as they were being killed and being martyred. And how is it they could have done such a thing? Well, it, it may be true that the um, they eventually they came to faith through wanting a gun, but even if that was the case for the reason to become a Christian, if they truly did become a Christian, then Jesus would have changed their heart and showed them that truly he was the Messiah and if they would have experienced God in a real way, real manner. And that's what it would have enabled them to be able to uh, to withstand the severe persecution they faced. It's the same for us as well. We too have the opportunity to deepen our faith, and when we do have these opportunities, then it's a good it provides us with great encouragement, especially at times when we are facing difficulties or feeling down in our faith as well. It gives us an opportunity to. Uh, reflect back on Jesus as the disciples did by looking at this uh, this transfiguration they experienced with Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be able to worship you today. 
Today we've looked at this transfiguration on the mountain passage and how we realize Jesus had the opportunity to talk with Elijah and Moses, how reminding us of how the Old Testament shows of how Jesus would be headed to the cross. Allow us to remember that. We also know that on Mount Hermon, the disciples were able to experience your presence, God, and how that has greatly encouraged them and can encourage us as well, reminding us that you are always with us. We remember that your presence can give us a strength and encouragement when we're facing difficult times in our lives. Right now, Lord, we know that you are providing us with opportunities to experience your presence, and we ask that we can remember these times and in the future as well. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you today. Pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we'll have a moment to pray together. In